This is important. Today, Citibank announced that they're going to allow banks to create their own tokens. And as Chad Steingraber says, they're going to need a bridge. Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to the show. Today's featured story is about Citibank, as you very well know. But there's so many more intricate details that I want to get into in today's video. We're going to talk about the RLN. We're going to talk about trade finance, ISO 20022, FedNow, XRP, Ethereum, and how all of that intertwines to a very unique date that's been floating around, November the 29th of this year. So to start off this story, we have to head all the way over to Bloomberg. And on Bloomberg, it talks about the Fed's test of this system. And it says this, the new offering comes on the heels of Citigroup's participation along with the unit of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and global banks in a months long test of the RLN. Remember, I talked about RLN earlier. I'm gonna go into what they are and what they do in just a second, which allowed banks to simulate issuing digital money representing their customers' own funds before settling through central bank reserves on a distributed ledger. The test proved to the Fed the so-called digital dollars have the ability to improve wholesale payments and that the use of the ledger didn't alter the legal treatment of the deposits. And if you go over to the RLN website and you can actually see what RLN do, they are very influential in all of this. They are literally the regulated liability network. They provide a regulated framework for these systems to operate and they come from the highest authority in this. But as they put it on the website, they are. The regulated liability network, RLN, is a contribution to the global debate on the future of money offered by a group of industry participants. It explores the technical, legal, and business characteristics necessary to provide on-chain, 24-7, programmable final settlement in sovereign currencies consistent of the liabilities of both public and private regulated financial institutions. These activities could enable a more functionally rich financial system that is compliant with all existing laws and regulations. So there's lots of words in there that we understand being XRP investors, right? We understand that 24 seven programmable money, that says a lot, right? There's only really a few that can do that. And especially on the, the in institutional level, it really starts to narrow it down even further. But I'm not going to jump to conclusions yet. We're going to get there. So we know that the RLN were involved. And we also know, and we can kind of put two and two together here, there was something released a few months ago called FedNow. We made a big deal of that at the time because the anticipation is via the partners, FedNow would actually eventually use XRP for their cross-border payments. Now, the thing about FedNow is that it's domestic only at launch. So when it launched, it was really just an American sender to an American receiver within the country that's domestic. But through their partners with the likes of Finastra and Temenos, we were expecting that when we move from domestic to now we're doing cross-border payments, that XRP would be that functional bridge asset in the middle, just like I said in the intro that Brad Steingraver said. There needs to be a bridge. And so while they don't explicitly tell us, all of the words, all of the terminology points us towards FedNow being the facilitator of these payments for Citigroup. So one thing to clarify here is that these Citibank tokenized deposits, which is essentially what they are, basically are allowing two different banks to create their own tokens and exchange value between them. Now, what most people aren't talking about is that this really is, it is cross-border. I will say it's cross-border. It goes from country to country, these tokenized deposit settlements. But what people aren't saying is that it is really only wholesale payments, institutional level payments between different branches of Citibank. We're not talking about Citibank to a whole nother bank across border. We're talking about Citibank to Citibank cross-border. So essentially, my, my big question here was, well, just like how there were instant payments in the US since 2017 without blockchain, why would this actually even require blockchain in the first place? And there's plenty of clues to tell us why blockchain is what they're going to use. I'm going to run through a few of those right now. The first thing is, well, the statement explicitly says that they're going to use blockchain technology for this is, is quite simple. But they also make mention of the words like smart contracts, private and permission blockchain, tokenization. All of these words are blockchain environment words. And so we can easily throw, I know that might sound very obvious, but we can now easily throw out the idea that they can just change ones to zeros and zeros to ones on their own 
kind of background ledger without blockchain and just update across all of the branches, we know that's not going to be the case. Why isn't that going to be the case? Well, because it's a lot more than domestic payments, right? When we look at Fed now, they're not using cross-border payments right now. So they actually have no use at present to use XRP because they aren't doing cross-border payments just yet. Now, this is a little venture into cross-border payments, but still keeping it within Citigroup. But we also know that Citigroup are heavily investing into blockchain, and they've even had partnerships with Maersk. I think it's like Maersk. It's like all the shipping containers, you know where it says Maersk on them. So Citibank have actually heavily delved into trade finance, for example which requires smart contract systems. So they're already making these moves onto the blockchain. They're investing heavily. But the other thing that comes about here as, as a part of the conversation is ISO 20022. If you're unaware of what ISO 20022 is, essentially every single payment that goes around the world must have a message attached. Forget everything you thought about payments. You have to break down payments into two sections. One is the messaging section. The other one is the value section. So if I want to send you $10 across across border, wherever I want to send it. As I click the button to send, what happens is a message goes just before to inform your bank that I'm about to send $10. Is that OK? And everyone verifies and says, yeah, thumbs up, thumbs up. Then the value is transferred. There's then a message that comes back to your bank to say we successfully delivered it and thank you and whatever they say. I don't know if they if, I don't know if they do small talk, <laughs> but this messaging standard is the way that these messages are formed. ISO 20022 is a more data rich type of message, meaning you can put more information in there to get extra clarity and actually be able to function even better and be able to do more using these payments and get better data on all of that stuff. Certainly, this is my opinion and many other people share this opinion. But when we're looking at crypto assets and digital assets in this blockchain environment, and we acknowledge that the world is moving in that direction from the traditional system to this new blockchain system, which Citigroup is showing us through and through with their involvement in trade finance and now these tokenized deposits, is that any digital assets that are affiliated or structured or built on the idea of sending payments that are ISO 20022 compliant, these are likely to be the ones that have real utility in this new world. The vast majority of other assets in this digital asset space, all these cryptos, they don't necessarily have this, this ISO compliant standard, but there are a few that do. And I think those are the ones that are gonna be highlighted throughout this video. We're talking about XRP. It pains me to say, but Ethereum and because Ethereum, because there was a fork of Ethereum made, that is XDC. I think these three are playing a fundamental role in the way things are going to operate in the future in this bigger ecosystem that we're talking about. XRP for these institutional grade payments, or at least the settlement of value. We're talking about Ethereum based blockchains, not Ethereum, the token, because Ethereum, the token is just a horrible medium of transferring value. It's a terrible payments cryptocurrency. If you didn't already know, I'm sure you did. But Ethereum based like XDC, which is built on the idea of transmitting value via smart contracts. They are also incredibly interoperable with all the other blockchains. I think you start looking at the ecosystem we're about to see and the, at the fundamental element of that. The thing that they all have in common is ISO 20022. Now, I'm sure you would love to know that Citigroup has actually been on the forefront of this migration over to ISO 20022. And they're going in accordance with, um, from a timeline perspective, side by side with Swift. Now, Swift is the messaging company of, of all the payments in the world. There are others and there are competitors that we see in, in Ripple and how they could diversify into R3 and take over Swift in all of this. But just as I mentioned ISO 20022, the people who are there in force to apply these messages to payments all around the world across all of these banks is the company Swift. Now Swift are very much affiliated with Citibank and so you can very easily see how this all ties in together. Now some people have speculated on the idea of this, the timing of all of this. You get the, the court case resolving, you get Fed now starting, albeit domestic only for now, but moving into cross-border. You've got the partners of FedNow that use, actually use or plan to be using XRP, the digital asset. XRP, the digital asset 
is the perfect solution for the concept of transmitting value from bank to bank using tokenized deposits. You need something in the middle to be able to convert that nice and easy so that each bank doesn't have to hold the tokens of the other banks. It's just a silly way of doing things. This is how banks have always worked. They've worked by holding vast amounts of foreign currencies in the bank, just waiting for payments so that they can make good on the IOUs that are generated when they make these payments. I know if you're a beginner here, that might be a little bit over the head, but XRP solves the problem of liquidity. If you exhaust all of your rubles in your bank and you've got no more rubles left, you are unable now to send value to Russia as a bank. That's a problem. That's a liquidity issue. If you put an asset in the middle of all of that and it's blockchain based, which we know this is where everything's going and you make that asset XRP, it's incredibly fast, it's incredibly cheap. Fast and cheap are two of the biggest solutions to the problems that they have with cross-border payments right now. You essentially take one bank's token, you put it into XRP and you convert that from XRP into the destination asset. And while perhaps it's, it might be a bit of a stretch to say that XRP is going to be that bridge asset for this stage of what Citibank's doing at this scale, but the real time to shine for XRP, the asset, will be when you start doing cross-border payments across ledgers, across different banks. So sending from JP Morgan to Citibank. That's not on Citibank's ledger, right? That's not a, a, a thing that they can just change numbers in their books and it will change across all of their different branches. You actually do need an asset in the middle that acts as a bridge currency. And that's what XRP is made for. It's, it's made for institutions to be sending money back and forth, removing the liquidity issues. And so in the timeline of things, you've got November the 19th, where we've got the FinPlus Live and Pilot current services that will be launched at that time. It all seems like the timeline of events with Fed now going live, the way they're moving into cross-border without making it truly cross-border and cross-company and cross-bank, and how on November the 19th this year, they're adding layers to that. So, and so as time goes on, you get more integrated with this new system, and eventually, eventually, the best technology will win. All of these pilots will be over, all of the tests will be over. They won't be using Ethereum-based technologies to send masses amounts of value to settle them on the blockchain. They will use the asset that's correct for that. In the same breath, you'll have trade finance where they will use the proper asset for that. They'll use XDC, they'll use smart contract systems, but value at the end of the day has to transfer from one blockchain to another, from one bank to another, and you have to have a bridge asset if you wanna remove liquidity issues, save money, make it faster, basically near instant payments cross border, which is five years ago, sounded like an alien technology, but it's actually happening now. When we look at cross-border, when you look at the G20 timeline, for example, cross-border payments are set to be in place with this new blockchain system, the way things are going to be from the end of 2025, moving into the beginning of 2026. And for me, that's massively exciting. I would love to know what you think, actually, because I've broken this down. I know that it's bank to bank. It's cross-border. But my question for you is, do you think that in this nature of cross-border payments, being Citibank to Citibank cross-border. Do you think they need XRP as a bridge? Do you think anything's gonna like flip on like a switch? <laughs> Is this that moment? I'll be fascinated to know what you think in the replies or the comments, depending on where you're watching this. In my personal opinion, and this is really my personal opinion based on what I have seen, so you don't need to get angry at me. I think the only chance that we have of XRP being used as this neutral bridge asset at scale is when FedNow launches their cross-border payments thing. And even then, if there are regulatory issues or there's some obstacle in the way, which there always seems to be, ultimately it comes down to the likes of Finastra, Temenos, using XRP as the asset for FedNow clients. If they don't do that, then we won't see movement in the price, right? Further than that, on-demand liquidity or using XRP to send payments or be this kind of liquidity bridge, that isn't the real game changer for XRP and XRP's price. The game changer is what everyone thinks looking around. You've got all the banks around the world going, wow, look at Fed now. That's really cool. Are they using blockchain? Are they using XRP? We probably should buy some of that. That's the thought process we're waiting for. We need banks to hold vast amounts. We need to take them, take tokens out of supply so that the demand continues to go up because people are buying it all up. 
Yes, people are using it, but that's not a real price driver. The price driver is when people take them out of circulation, so there's less in the supply, but the demand is going up, meaning the price has to go up. That is simple supply and demand. We can talk about flipping the switch moments and all of that, but ultimately it always comes down to supply and demand. Can we generate so much demand that it reduces the supply, increasing the price? I think it's, it's, the, it's the onlooker mentality where people go, wow, look at that. That's really cool. Can we do that? Maybe we should just buy some of that asset so that we can hoard it while we think about how to use it. Like that's the type of mentality we need. I think that really honestly comes about in the height of a speculation bull run because the most amount of attention is on crypto in the height of a speculation bull run. When does that happen? Well, that's the big question. All I know is that all the regulation hurdles, all of the adoption in the background, the acknowledgement of these assets on a research level and a pilot level, they all happen when everyone is most bored. Are you bored? I think people are bored right now. I think right now is probably the lowest sentiment I've seen while creating content on YouTube so far. I think people are so bored and so tired of everything not moving. But just let me be clear, all of the most important moves that are happening on an institutional level, which affects me and you and our XRP, they're all being made right now, right? It's all happening right now. Under the covers, behind closed doors, they'll release some sort of transparency thing where they talk about ISO and different dates for different messages to go live and all of that. They'll be transparent with that stuff without giving us the full information, but don't be fooled. They're all laying the groundwork right now. The foundations are built and the house comes in a speculation bull run. In my opinion, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Let me know in the replies or the comments down below. So this is great news about Citibank. It gives us a, an idea of how banking banks are going to work and tokenized deposits, the role that they play. Just because there's tokenized deposits does not remove the requirement for a bridge asset in the middle. I believe that to be XRP. Let me know what you think. I think you're probably the same, but let me know if you have a different thought in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you share it with your friends, share it all over Twitter, wherever you share it. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Don't just let the algorithm spit my videos at you. Get alerted every time I make a video. That's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Stay emotionless and I'll see you in the next one.